Hey, it's good to see you all out this morning and uh, I invite you to stand and join with us as we sing together. seated. Good morning, Parkview Church. Good to see everybody this morning. A couple things, make sure you're checking out the slideshow before and after service, let you know what's going on, what's coming up, and what's happening today. I'd encourage you to grab a bulletin, read through a bulletin, let you know what's happening in our church family, uh, things that are going on, missionary updates, connecting, all kinds of good stuff like that. So please make sure that you do that. That would be awesome. Read through that. Um, ways to be praying for people. I mean, in your bulletin is this tear-off tab. We ask everybody to fill this out. It's a great way for us to know just what's going on in our church family. So fill this out, leave it in your pew, and the ushers will come by and pick that up. That would be awesome. And uh, if you have any prayer requests, you can write those down on here as well and know that staff and elders will be praying for it this week. So please take some time to do that. That would be great. And again, leave that in your pew so we can uh, the ushers can get that picked up. Okay, couple things here. Uh, 
Ed, Edward and Christine Clausen will present a concert at noon at the Senior Center on May 5th. If you are interested in hearing that, they're a very talented couple who's performed in many places. If you're interested in knowing more about that or would like to get more information or say, I want to go, you need to contact Betty Seibel. Is Betty Seibel? There's Betty. Everybody look, Betty's waving. Talk to Betty. She will definitely hook you up there and make sure that you are good. So I uh, would encourage you to be a part of that. Um, let's see. Um, so this afternoon after church, for all people who are part of like Christian education, who are teachers and volunteers in the Christian ed department, there is a, um, a lasagna meal for you. And so just want to encourage you, you and your family to come right after service in the activity center. We have lasagna, salad, bread, and dessert. Uh, it's an appreciation dinner because they couldn't do it without you. They will just want me to say you're so grateful for the many people who give their time in teaching and assisting Sunday school classes, Wednesday night activities, nursery, and more. So if that's you, come join us in the meal afterwards as a token of thanks. And again, just have a great time being together. So if that's you, I would encourage you to make that a part of your afternoon. Uh, let's see. Um, man, I think that's all I have right now. So I'm going to introduce a video. We're going to show a video about Tabor Day coming up here soon. Today, very soon, yes. On April 30th. They're going to talk about that. So Tabor College's lone building burned to the ground. The school's very existence was threatened. Was Tabor College worth rebuilding? It was a day of decision. Tabor still lives. That was the refrain that emerged from the smoke and ash. Tabor College wasn't dead, nor was it destroyed, only its building. But the spirit of Tabor remained. It was a flame that could not be extinguished. Two years after the great fire on April 30th, 1920, the Tabor faithful gathered again to celebrate a new Tabor, grand and glorious. Two buildings rose from the ashes of one. It was the first Tabor day. Some say the past is prologue, and so we are reigniting Tabor Day. In many ways, we are building Tabor each and every day in the spirit of Tabor, faithfulness, service, courage, resilience still burns. Each day we are faithfully serving Christ by sending a new generation into the world for a kingdom impact. And we're walking through the fires before us with courage and resilience because our calling leads us on. Thank you for your kingdom partnership, for helping make Tabor College a place of transformation. And we invite you to participate in what God is doing here. Pray, give, come see us as we forge ahead together in Christ's kingdom work. Let's celebrate the spirit of Tabor. So today marks the rebirth of Tabor Day. And uh, on that first Tabor Day, it also happened to be Arbor Day. And so they planted trees as a part of that celebration. And so today we are having a tree planting ceremony at two o'clock. And you are welcome to join us. You're invited to be a part of that. It's a way of uh, celebrating God's goodness, God's provision, but also this spirit of Tabor that overcomes obstacles, that it, service and faithfulness and resilience. And we'd love for you to be a part of, of that service. It's at 2 o'clock on Tabor's campus, right in the center, right in front of the library by the Centennial Plaza. You're welcome to come. It'll be just a short service. If you want, you can bring a lawn chair if you, you might need to, to sit down. And then you're invited to FOSPA, which is Sweebok Ham and Cheese in the Fine Arts Center in the Heritage Lobby. And you can enjoy that. And then you can also stay. You're invited to the Spring Oratorio at 3. And there's a free cookout with the students uh, at 5 o'clock just north of the dining hall you're free to be a part of that too. If you want to go to that, come find me at the tree planting. I got, I've got a ticket for you that'll get you into the, the cookout. But we just want to thank you as our partnering church uh, for your generosity, for your, your prayers, and for your kingdom partnership with us. So you're invited today at, at 2 o'clock. Thank you.
At this time, since graduations are so early now, we are going to recognize our graduates, those who are maybe getting promoted from eighth grade on up, um, to high school graduates, college grads, and even post-college. Uh, uh, we want to take some time to recognize you and just... Um, yeah, encourage you and just say it's so it's been so good to have you a part of uh, of our church and a part of what you guys are doing and look forward to what's next. So what I'd like to do now is I would like uh, for our eighth graders who are going to be eighth graders going into high school to come on up. So yeah, come on up. Come up here and line up right here beside me. Okay, all I'm asking you to say or do is just give us your name because we know you're going to be freshman next year. We kind of know what's next, but want to at least hear your name and then we want to have a little gift for you and just want to recognize you guys. So I'll hand you the mic and you just pass it on down. My name is Braxton Hebert. My name is Amy Kelly. My name is Amaya Worth. My name is Jake Sabine. Okay. We are looking forward to, as a church, continuing to encourage you guys as you go through high school, encourage you guys as you grow in your faith, and we want you to know that we as a church are your biggest advocates and can't wait to see how God grows you and develops you into a, a deeper follower of Jesus Christ. So on behalf of the church, we have a gift for you that we would like to give you in honor of you being promoted from eighth grade going into high school. So would you give them a round of applause, please? Okay, next we'd like to honor high school graduates. So if you're graduating high school, come on up. Come on up. Yeah, I know. It's funny, they all look at me like, do I really have to come up? And I'm like, yeah, you do actually, so. Well, as high school seniors, your eyes are getting ready for what's next. And, and, and for all of you, I'm assuming that's college. I know for some people that's working or a tech school, anything like that. Um, but again, we as a church want to just bless you and thank you guys uh, for uh, just participating with the life of the church. Uh, it's been a joy and a privilege to get to know you guys, to see you guys grow up here and, and uh, be a part of the church body. And so what we'd love to hear is, again, name and what you'll be doing next year the plans okay my name is Brecken Rasliff and I'll be playing basketball at Ottawa University my name is Ainsley Duell I plan to attend college I haven't picked one yet but I'll be majoring in elementary education with an emphasis in special education my name is Keely Brewer I'll be attending Tabor College to major in biochemistry right. well again on behalf of the church we want to bless you guys can't wait to see what God does in your life. Encourage you that as you take these next steps in the college to build upon that foundation of Jesus Christ. He's our rock. And I want you guys to know that we are here as a church, even if we're, you guys are away, maybe not so far, but it's still away. Um, but you're away, but we are still your biggest advocates. We want to support you guys and love you guys as best we can. So thank you guys. Awesome. Congratulations. Give them a round of applause, please. Okay, now, if you are graduating college or uh, post-college, you got to stand on up and come up here. Even if you're like, this is my first day here, I don't care. Come on up. We want to hear from you. I know we have a few people, so come, yeah, don't, don't be bashful. Yes, yes. So again, if you are a college senior graduating, come on up, and we want to recognize you guys. So... Um, again, congratulations. It's awesome. 
uh, we would love to hear from you what's next and what you're planning on doing. Or if you're already kind of in your wheelhouse, tell us what you're doing. And that way we can just uh, celebrate with you guys. Okay, so I'm Jonathan Unruh. I'm graduating from Tabor with an ag business degree. And um, my next step is I'll be getting married in July. Uh, and then I can start thinking about a career. No. <laughs> so... Um, I have a job lined up with an agronomist back home in Meade, Kansas, so that's what I'll be doing after um, I have another semester here with uh, Lauren, so that's what I'll be doing. Um, my name is Lindsay Hinscher. I'll be graduating from Tabor from their Masters of Neuroscience and Trauma program. So I'm already a teacher, so I'll be using this knowledge in my classroom a lot. And besides just the knowledge, I've like, the Lord is just like, swelled my heart with um, empathy and compassion like for my students so I've learned gained a lot of knowledge but I'm excited to use that in my classroom just having empathy for people and stuff so yeah that is awesome to hear well we want to bless you guys and cannot wait to see what God does through you guys continues to do through you as you teach and shape uh, students um, but want to just yeah, bless you thank you guys for being a part of us and thank you for continuing to be a part of us uh, but just know that uh, Parkview is always your biggest support biggest advocates and we um, it's just been so awesome to have you guys be with us so let's give them a big round of applause Let's stand together and, uh, and sing. I, I do need a capo.
but the King of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from. Holy is my fall. Let the King of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life.
Our scripture that reading this morning is taken from Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope hope of the glory of God. More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that sufferings produces knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You may be seated. I'm going to be praying some of the words from Psalm 138 with us this morning, and I just ask that you would join me. Dear Lord, I give you thanks with all my heart. I will sing your praises before the gods. Dear Father, there are lots of gods in our world, but you are high and well above any of those. They are nothing to you. And we praise you as we encounter people who follow those gods. We sing your praises, even in their presence. I will bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your mercy and your truth. For you have made your word great according to all your name. We thank you, Lord, that you are a God of mercy and a God of truth. Sometimes it's hard for us to see how those two go together, but we know that you have that and that you balance those perfectly. We ask that you would give us the ability also to show your mercy and your truth to those that we meet. On the day I called you, called, you answered me. You made me bold with strength in my soul. All the kings of the earth will give thanks to you, Lord, when they have heard the words of your mouth. Dear Father, no matter who we see, no matter who we are in front of, no matter what their power in this world is, you are well above them. You give us a boldness before them. You give us strength to respond. We pray that you will not allow us to be intimidated by those of this world who feel like they have power, but to stand firmly for you, to sing your praises. We give you thanks, Lord, for who you are. And Father, we know that when we do so, in verses 5 here, it says, And they will sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. For the Lord is exalted, yet he looks after the lowly, but he knows the haughty from afar. We pray that as we encounter people who may feel like they're more powerful, more, more looked up to than we are, we pray that they will come to a point to sing of your ways and the, great, the greatness of your glory. We call them to follow you, no matter what position they might hold in this world. 
We know that you understand, you know, you see our hearts and you side with those who appear lowly in this world. And you also know and you see the hearts of those who are haughty, who are proud, whose hearts swell with pride. You know their hearts. You know our hearts. Help our hearts to be where you want them to be. Dear Father, we think of others in our, in our congregation that are struggling with different health issues. We think of Don Reimer. Sounds like he will be in the hospital for a while, Lord. And we just ask that you would help him to sense your presence, your relief from pain. We pray also that he would bring his heart closer to you each moment that he's there that he would see your healing power in his life and in his body. We pray also for Carla Kozlowski. We thank you so much for the success of the procedure and the lack of pain that she's experiencing and the great opportunity she has for recovery. We just praise you for your healing power in that. We pray for Jim Ratzliff. We pray that you would help his body to absorb the nutrients that it needs, that he might grow stronger and healthier. We thank you for the healing that you've given to Marilyn Fleming. We pray for Caitlin Rempel in a very special way right now. Just ask that you would give her, continue to give her a greater relief from her headaches. Micaiah Mays, we pray also for her legs to be strengthened and to grow normally. We pray deeply for Larry and Susan Payne. Um, who couldn't be here this morning because of the pain that they are experiencing. Just ask that you would help Larry in a special way as he continues to um, battle with pain from his cancer. Guide us now, Lord. Give us your direction. Help our gifts and our offerings to be pleasing unto you. We pray that you will give Tom your words, and that we will hear your words come through his mouth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Today's scripture text is, is a bit odd. Um, it, it's not totally out there, but if you've been following along with us in the book of Acts, it's, it, it's like one more of the same thing. And you almost feel like, what do you say about this that we didn't say before? The apostle Paul is on his way to Rome. Uh, God has told him that, but not everybody else realizes that's gonna happen. And he's gonna stand trial. But all these things leading up to it are sort of these pre-trials. He sits down and he's accused of things and he defends himself and then nothing really happens. That happened in our last uh, week's text and then he sat in jail for two years. And now there's a new person in charge and, uh, and they're gonna try this again. So the Apostle Paul is uh, one of the main uh, people that we see in, throughout this uh, book in the Bible we call Acts. The longer name of Acts traditionally was the Acts of the Apostles. And Paul was an apostle. The apostles were the people chosen by Jesus Christ to be his early witnesses, to be the, found, the founders of the church, to begin the work that was to happen after Jesus died and rose from the dead and ascended to be at the right hand of the Father. So these are, these are the people leading and guiding and establishing the church in the first century Paul came into this a little bit differently than everybody else. The others were uh, chosen by Jesus while he was still walking in the face of the earth and, and brought along, and they were disciples, but he named them apostles. He gave them that title, that role. And when Paul speaks of himself, he said, I came last of all as one untimely born. I didn't come in like everybody else, but I was called by Christ. And he recounts three times in the book of Acts his testimony of how Jesus called him to go and do his work. And so what we've come to in Acts 25 verses 1 through 12 is that, as I said, Paul's been uh, arrested uh, on charges that were untrue. Um, basically arrested just to keep the religious leaders, the people who were mad at him, from killing him. Uh, he was just brought into custody to protect him almost. And then he stood trial and then he went to uh, another ruler and he moved from Jerusalem to Caesarea. Felix was the governor and he didn't figure things out. He just strung this along because he had the power to. They didn't have the rules we have about the legal system. He could just leave him in jail pending a, maybe a trial, maybe just staying there, maybe whatever. So one of the things we're going to continually see, and one of the things that I want to highlight in this text is I want to highlight the, the systems of power going on and how God is at work even in the midst of that and how God's people interact with systems of power that work with them and against them and how that works. That's a big, that's a big order, but we're going to work on that a little bit. Let's read the text and we'll continue um, talking about it. This is Acts 25, verses 1 through 12. Now, three days after Festus had arrived in the province, he went up to Jerusalem from Caesarea, and the chief priests and the principal men of the Jews laid out their case against Paul, and they urged him, asking as a favor against Paul, that he summon him to Jerusalem, because they were planning an ambush to kill him on the way. Festus replied that Paul was being kept in Caesarea, and that he himself intended to go there shortly. So, he said, let the men of authority among you go down with me. And if there is anything wrong about the man, let them bring charges against him. After he stayed among them not more than eight or ten days, he went down to Caesarea. And the next day he took his seat on the tribunal and ordered Paul to be brought. When he had arrived, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him, bringing many and serious charges against him that they could not prove. Paul argued in his defense, neither against the law of the Jews, nor against the temple, nor against Caesar have I committed any offense. But Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, said to Paul, do you wish to go up to Jerusalem and there be tried on these charges before me? But Paul said, I am standing before Caesar's tribunal where I ought to be tried. Let the Jews I have, to the Jews I have done no wrong, as you yourself know very well. If then I am a wrongdoer and have committed anything for which I deserve to die, I do not seek to escape death. But if there is nothing to the charges against me, no one can give me up to them. I appeal to Caesar." 
Then Festus, when he had conferred with his council, answered, To Caesar you have appealed, to Caesar you shall go. And so, God, we ask that you would add your blessing to the reading, hearing, and understanding of your word this morning. So, you know from our own history and things that every time there's a new leader, there's this surge of hope. Well, there's actually a surge of despair with some of the leaders, depending on whether you've for them or against them, and then there's this surge of hope. Every time our nation has a new president, there's a group of people who said, maybe, maybe this is going to be the time something changes, something gets done, things get made right. And often, even if some of those things happen, the end result is some amount of disappointment. I mean, really. They don't ever do everything they tell you they're going to do. They don't ever accomplish everything that they say they're going to accomplish Some of them don't even stick to very many of the promises they say they're going to bring. It's always somebody else's fault, but ultimately, they don't deliver. So we have a change of leadership from Felix to Festus, and I wonder if there was some hope that Paul had. Maybe with somebody new, we can get somewhere. You can tell there was a hope with the Jewish leaders who were trying to uh, try Paul to... Maybe we can get somewhere. Maybe we can get this guy to do what we want him to do. And yet, just like the governor before him, he played both sides masterfully. Pandering to the Jews, but never really giving them what they want. Kind of trying to talk to Paul and give him some room to speak, but never actually coming to a conclusion. He's just doing what the leaders apparently before him had done. The same thing again. The same process, the same outcome, the same way of just working the system. It's pretty ugly. There's still a lot of underhanded sneakery, which I found out isn't a word unless I'm misspelling it. There's a little red line under it when I put it on my computer. But I like sneakery is a good word. There's a lot of sneakery. There's a desire to pander to both sides. There's an effort to work toward making sure that all these powerful people are placating while keeping himself out of trouble. And just look at the way that Festus deals with this conversation. If you look at verse 9, he offers. um, You see already the Jews ask, you know, uh, for Paul to be brought to them. And he's like, no, you can come with me to Caesarea. I'm going to extend my authority. This is where it should happen. So you guys can come down with me. But then once they're there, he offers to send Paul to them. Festus wishing to do the Jews a favor. That's what's in his heart. He says to Paul, do you wish to go up to Jerusalem and there be tried on these charges before me? I'll take the court down there. That's how it's working. And Paul's in prison As I said before, he's not really on trial. It's more of a pre-trial. It's this sort of leading up to it and never really getting down to it. And all of this reminds me of something that Jesus said to his disciples in Matthew chapter 10. Which I failed to mark accurately. In Matthew chapter 10, Jesus has just sent out his disciples. They've been working with him, training with him, seeing, learning from him. They've seen him do all of these amazing works and and heard his teaching. And now he sent them out to do the same things that he's been doing. Go on out and do it, he says, which is a pretty daunting task. And that's Matthew 10, 5 and following is Jesus sending them out and he gives them instructions for how they're to do things. But then he gives them this warning in verse 16. In verse 16, he says, Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Now that metaphor is used a couple of different ways in scripture, this idea of sheep and wolves. But what he's saying is I'm sending you out as some of the most vulnerable among some of the most dangerous. You're going out into the world where people will harm you, will persecute you, will act against you. He tells them later, you're going to be imprisoned, thrown into jail. And we don't see any evidence that this happened on the first time he sent them out. 
He sent them out. They come back. They share what happened. They're actually pretty excited. It seems successful. This really worked. So in many ways, he's warning them about what could happen, and he's explaining to them what definitely, eventually will happen. That these, Paul's not in this group, but these are the disciples who he's named apostles, and he said, you're going to go out, and it's going to be dangerous. And so Paul's in a similar situation that he describes for them in the later sections of this, that you're going to be in prison. People are going to put you on trial, try to harm you. Like sheep in the midst of wolves, the defenseless among the most dangerous. So this is his advice. In light of that, be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. That's Matthew 10, 16. He tells them to, in 17, Beware of men, for they will deliver you over to courts and flog you in their synagogues, and you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake, to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. Paul's not in this group, but as he becomes an apostle, he, as much if not more than all of the other apostles, lives this out. And here he is in the midst of it. We've talked about in previous scriptures that God has spoken to Paul and said, you're going to suffer for my sake. You're going to be arrested, but keep with it. He tells him, you're going to end up in Rome. And the way that he gets there is in shackles as a prisoner, fulfilling what God had called him to and spoken to him, but not in a way that I would really want to do it. But as we look at Jesus' words that describe what Paul is dealing with, and we see the way that he lives this out, we look at sheep as the most vulnerable, wolves as the most dangerous, but then the serpents and doves. I don't think there's any other place where serpent is used as a positive example in the scripture. Just think about how you think of, how do you react when you see a snake? I know there's some crazy people out there that want to pick them up. I don't know what's wrong with you people. I don't understand you. There are people who just want to pick them up. I spent some time working uh, with some people in, in Appalachia, out in like eastern Kentucky and Tennessee. Those people will pick up a poisonous snake and just show him to you. There's something wrong with that. <laughs> right? Our natural reaction is fear and for a reason. We don't know what those things are going to do. They sneak out from under rocks or between logs and they... But they're also crafty. They get away. I took a garter snake from the front of my house and I was carrying it way out into the yard, way away. And I'll be honest, I was going to get rid of it permanently. <laughs> right, wrong, or indifferent, it was not going to come back to my house. And the grass was this long and I dropped him on the ground and he disappeared. I mean, he got under the grass and I couldn't see this thing anymore. He's crafty, sneaky little guy. I don't know where he is. He might be back in my basement this year. I'm not sure. Sorry, darling. <laughs> I tried. Felt like a real failure that day. But think, that's how we think of snakes or serpents is they're, they're crafty, they're sneaky, they show up when you don't expect them. And the, there's always that fear that you could not be doing anything to harm them and you get bitten. You know, you think about finding a rattlesnake. You got that one warning. Shh. When I'm out in the desert where I know there's rattlesnakes or places, I'm not in the desert. And when I'm in places where I don't go to the desert, when I'm in places where I know there's rattlesnakes, I can hear like a rock fall down the hill. And, you know, every little sound might be a rattlesnake. Something's going to get me. There's a reason that image brings anxiety to us, and it's used in such a negative way in the scripture. But here... Jesus says, be wise, or some of the translations even say crafty as serpents. I think if you learned that in the King James, that's probably what you heard. Be crafty as serpents. That doesn't sound like good advice. I mean, it's the words of Jesus. I'm not arguing with him. I'm just saying it doesn't sound like good advice. So what is he saying? What does that mean? We get to act like snakes? But he's... he's speaking to a specific aspect of the serpent, to be wise in a particular way, wise to the way that things work in the world. But the balance of that is that while you're being wise as a serpent, you are to be as innocent as a dove. 
Does, do doves scare anybody? Probably there are less people that are scared by doves than there are people who aren't scared by snakes, right? I mean, there are people who are afraid of birds. It's like a weird phobia thing, right? I'm sorry if, you, if that's you and I called you weird. I didn't mean it, but um, it's like, it's, it's, but doves, doves don't ever harm you. They don't, there's a reason it wasn't doves in the movie, The Birds, that everyone was afraid of. No, it was like crows and things. Those birds are scary, but doves, doves are, you know, I mean, it's just, Hang out. The worst thing you get is a mess on your shirt if you're not careful. They're not dangerous. They're innocent. They're seen as this wise as serpents, but innocent as doves. Now, I, I could dig into that more and more and more and more, but I think I've, to add another animal to the list, I think I've beaten the dead horse almost. So, But think about how we understand innocence or the loss of innocence. There's a there's a beauty to the innocence of children. They don't know things yet. Or when they do things that are out of line or that we know are inappropriate, and we say, oh, it's just innocence, right? They're just so innocent, even though that was really out of line. They just did it in their innocence. They describe somebody very bluntly and honestly. They don't mean to be rude about it. They're just saying, this is what I see. There's a naivety or an innocence to that. And even when we look at the story of Adam and Eve, we often see that as innocence being lost through the gaining of knowledge, like they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But I want to challenge that concept that innocence was lost with knowledge because I think innocence was lost with choosing for themselves. Innocence was lost when they reached out and took that for which God said, this is not for you. Innocence was lost when they did the things that God said, you don't do this. Everybody gets hung up on the fact that, oh, they came to know something. And, and the critics of the Christian faith even say, God just wants Christians to be ignorant, to not know anything. And that's how they maintain their innocence. That was not God's desire for his people, was that they be ignorant, that they not know anything, that they remain naive. It was his desire for his people that they trust him and be obedient to him. And the, lack of in, the loss of innocence or the lack of innocence came from sinning against God, from choosing their way instead of God's way. So when Jesus calls his followers, his apostles, in these difficult circumstances to be wise as serpents but innocent as doves, I don't know every little nuance to what that means, but what I do know is that innocence does not, in that instance, equal naivety. And that's what Jesus is telling his disciples. You can be innocent without being naive. You can be innocent without just blundering your way into all kinds of problems. You don't have to be absolutely unaware of how the world works to be innocent. You don't have to be incapable of engaging with the world, especially in your defense at times, to be innocent. What I think Jesus is telling us is that we can engage with worldly powers, and in fact, we should seek to understand them, but we can only engage the, with them in ways that allow us to remain, in a sense, untouched by them, untainted, unchanged. So look at Paul. He knows his rights. That's one of the things I see in this. And we've seen it before. He has used his right as a citizen. Citizenship was, was not something everybody in Rome had. It was special. It has a, had great privileges, much as our citizenship does, but even more so. And it was even a little less uh, common. Not everybody was a citizen. And Paul used his citizenship to his advantage when it furthered the work of the kingdom of God. There are times he didn't claim his rights as a citizen, when he didn't stand up and say, you can't do this, I'm a citizen, and I don't know why. Except that I see again and again, the example of Paul is that he uses his rights as a citizen primarily when it allows him to continue the work that God's given him to do. And here he knows his rights, he understands what he's entitled to, he knows how to deal with these people, and although Jesus further instructions to the apostles is don't plan ahead everything you're going to say. Trust that the Spirit is going to guide you in these moments. And yet Paul is prepared because he is wise in the ways of the world and yet remains innocent. He claims his innocence. He said, I have not sinned against the Jews, which they're claiming. I have not sinned against the temple, 
which is part of what they have him on trial for. He, they claim he has desecrated the temple, which sounds like a Jewish problem, but it's a Roman problem. Desecrating a temple of any faith in the Roman Empire is a big deal. And he said, I'm not, I've not sinned against Caesar. I've not, I have not broken any laws in any of those arenas. He maintains his innocence and he acts in a way that is proper, and yet he can tell them, these are the expectations. He knows his rights. He exercises them. He said, I, he, they say, you want to go down to Jerusalem to have a trial? He already knows they tried to ambush him once. That was the plan. If they can get him to go from the barracks to the, to the temple where he'd be tried, then on the way they were going to try to kill him. And that ruler's reaction to that knowledge was to send him to Caesarea. Now he's in Caesarea. He's been there for two years, and it's the same old story again. If they can get him to be transferred to Jerusalem, maybe with a very light armored accompaniment, then they'll ambush them, kill him, leave everyone else alone, and no one will ever really know why or how it happened. And Paul's taken care of. This is the amount of work that Paul is doing. This is the danger, the threat that Paul is posing to them is they just want to get rid of him. So he's wise as a serpent in the sense that he knows what they're trying to do. He's fully aware of it. He's not naive to this. Oh, yeah, send me to Jerusalem. Those are my people. We'll just deal with this. No, he knows what they're trying to do. But he also knows that God has called him to go to Rome. And it's not typical for, to hear God says, you're going to do this and say, all right, I'm going to make it happen. But in this instance, Paul's kind of pushed into it. He said, we'll make it happen. He appeals to Caesar. He knows that his right is he is in the place where he should be tried for this. There's no reason to send me down there. I'm where I should be at. The other side of that is he knows that as a citizen, he has the right to appeal to Caesar. So I'm completely innocent. So I appeal to Caesar. Some people think that his appeal to Caesar was just saying, again, in another way, I'm in the right place. This is where I should be tried. And then maybe Festus was ready to be rid of him and just took it a little more literally. I think that's probably not the case. I think it's more likely that he very much intended to go and speak to Caesar. And he knew that he was called by God to go do this. And he thought, well, here's a way to make it happen that protects me from them and gets me there. And so I'll speak it out. In all of this, he doesn't sin. He's careful to do what is right, to speak respectfully, but boldly. We see Jesus' words lived out in the life of Paul. There's always in this world going to be forces against us as believers if we're trying to live out our faith. We live in a place where we have great freedom and, a, and, a, and wonderful uh, ways that we can speak freely and openly about our faith and not be arrested for it, not be persecuted in the same sense that they were for. There's many of you may never be on trial for your faith, even though you live it out faithfully. I pray that's true. So it makes you wonder, how does this apply to us? But to remember that there may always be some force at work against us because of our faith, because of what we're trying to do, because of our faithfulness to Jesus Christ, just as Paul had the same. So our temptation might be to bite back. You know, somebody's trying to get, I'm just going to, maybe we fight fire with fire. If they're going to work against me in this way, I'm going to go at it just as hard with the same the same tactics, use the enemy's weapons against them. That's our temptation, right? Well, they've done this, so now I've got a right to do that. It's a little bit like I tell some of my children. There's four of them, so I'll not name names, but I have to teach my children. Just because they did something wrong doesn't mean you should. Just because they behaved that way doesn't mean you get to return the same thing, right? We know this, we get taught that, but it's hard to remember it sometimes when we're living out life. Someone's mistreated me. I get to do it back now. All those things about how I'm supposed to behave, that's off the table now because they did that. And yet, the way that we are called to live as Christians, as followers of Jesus Christ, is not negated just because somebody else doesn't act like a Christian, especially when it's someone who isn't a Christian or who is serving a system that is not inherently Christian. So we're not called to use the same weapons against other people. If we come back to Paul and his ongoing work, what he did again and again was proclaim the gospel. Even in all these places where he's defending himself, this is the first one where we don't hear much of what he said, except that he defended his innocence and, and said that he wanted to go to see Caesar. 
But repeatedly in his defense, in his words, in his effort, he found the way to tell people the gospel message, the good news of Jesus Christ, why he is going to these lengths, why he's willing to suffer these problems and these consequences. Why is he willing to do all of this? It's because of the hope of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the hope that we have in resurrection. Because, because he has been called by the Lord to go and proclaim the gospel, to tell people the good news of Jesus Christ. And again and again, even in his defense, he finds a way to bring the gospel into this. Let me tell you about this. Let me tell you about why this matters, why I'm so intent on this, why I keep going after it. And even in prison, we see that he's writing letters to churches and encouraging them and telling them the gospel message. It's not hindered, his, it's not hindered or stopped his ministry. In fact, it's given him a whole different avenue of ministry. And so one of the ways that we would apply this is to remember that when we face opposition and hardship, that our temptation is to respond in kind, but we are called to a better path by Jesus. That while we don't need to be naive to how people might do things, we are called still to be innocent. We can also remember that Paul's hardship did not prevent him from sharing the gospel and doing his work. It may have felt like it was very restraining. I can't imagine being in prison for two years, ready to get out there and tell people about Jesus Christ to do the work that you think God has sent you to do. And there you are in prison, just waiting, being called on by some ruler who really just wants to see if he can get some money out of you. That would be hard. And so I would also encourage you with this text and with the example of Paul's life and work that no part of your life is wasted by God. If you feel like you're just in this holding pattern trying to figure things out, just stuck because something isn't working out or something's not going the way it should, that God can redeem and use every single one of those moments, just as he did for Paul's work. And by the time we get to the end of Acts, spoiler alert, we're going to see that we're told that the gospel was not hindered by any of this. And lastly, I think another way to look at this is that when we look at the corruption of the leaders that Paul was dealing with, and we look at our world today, and we say, man, is, what are these people doing? Whether you thought that more these last four years or more the four years before that, we don't have to get into that. But you look at our leaders and you think, what are you doing? Does anybody, I was in a state before I moved here, where it became clear that none of our elected officials really cared about the people. I mean, it just became evident. They cared about fighting. They cared about getting their way. They cared about power plays. And meanwhile, the people of the state suffered. None of those people seemed to care about us. They weren't doing their job. When we look at corruption of leaders, you look at the world and you say, man, is it ever going to get any better how could it get any worse? I hope it doesn't. It looks like it is. How, we get filled with those feelings. And I'm not going to tell you that we've got a lot of great hope in the near future. But what I will tell you is that when we look at the leaders who should be doing better, it makes us long for the leadership and the rulership of the good king. Let that remind you of how blessed we are to say that these rulers may rule us in an earthly sense, but we have a king that is greater and higher and mightier and more powerful than any of them. And it's his kingdom that our citizenship first belongs to. That, to me, is very comforting. And so when you compare earthly power and authority and craftiness with the way that Jesus did things, you have leaders who are more intent on getting and receiving and building their own name and their own finances. And Jesus came and he gave and he gave and he gave. He said, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And to give his life as a ransom for many. You see earthly principalities and powers looking to protect self, to protect their own reputation, to look out for themselves. But you see Jesus continually looking out for his followers. He says the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. And that's what he did. That Jesus Christ was crucified, killed, shed his blood for our sins. And you look at the authoritarianism of most earthly leadership systems versus the authority of Jesus, the authority that comes from 
serving, leading, guiding, helping, sustaining, even correcting versus the, authority, the, the authoritarianism we often see that demands absolute power, loyalty even in the midst of their own failures. You see Jesus who exercised his authority by serving, by loving, by caring, certainly by teaching and expecting certain behavior and certain actions, but we see him as a servant. This is our good king whom we serve, whose kingdom we are, we who are Christians are citizens of. And finally, I would just say that Jesus showed us how we should live, but he also proved himself to be the one who was worthy of our allegiance, the one who is worthy of our praise, the one who is worthy of our devotion, and the one who is worthy of our imitation. So follow after Jesus. The apostle Paul has been our example in this text, but he said once to his disciples, to, to his churches that he was leading, follow me as I follow Christ. Follow my example as I seek to follow the imitation of Christ. And so I would put the same thing before you, that we look to Jesus as our great example, that the way he handled the world is the way that we should. That when we feel like we might want to respond with more power, with more might, with more craftiness, with whatever we think is more effective, I would urge you to put your trust in Jesus Christ, certainly for your salvation, but put your trust in Jesus to know that the way of Jesus still works, that the sacrifice of Jesus is still effective, that serving like Jesus still is a powerful way to work in this world. Let's pray. God, I give you thanks for today. I give you thanks for your holy word and all that you have done here among us. Um, just ask that you would uh, lead and guide us and uh, receive uh, our praise as uh, the only one who is worthy of it. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing in response.
step down from glory to wear my sin and bear my sin. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Please have a seat. Uh, I want to apologize real quick. When I was talking about college graduates and, and people coming up or graduating from college, I forgot to mention Project Search as well. In my brain, they were the same thing. So we would like to take some time to honor Danae Reimer as she comes up here, as she's graduating with Project Search and want to hear what's next for her. So, Danae, could you please tell us what the plan is for you next after Project Search? I will be working at the Hillsborough Museum doing data entry for them and anything else they have for me. Awesome. Well, we are so proud of you, and it's awesome to see how God is working in your life, and we want to continue to be that encouragement for you here, that whatever you need from us as a church, we want to help you out as best we can, and we're so glad that you find a place to plug in and to work. We just pray that God continues to use your gifts to bless others. So on behalf of the church, we want to extend a congratulations to you, give you this small little gift for, as a token of our appreciation, but also want to recognize you again one more time.
Well, um, as the service comes to a close, why don't you stand for the closing blessing? Sorry, up and down. Um, we, uh, I, my often phrase that I use about worship is, is uh, you know, we're, I don't care about us being really slick. I just care about us honoring God and uh, building up one another. So that's what we're trying to do. Um, Thanks for, thanks for your patience this morning. Uh, if, if you're a guest or visiting, uh, you just need to know that we often close with a benediction. It's a blessing. And uh, as preachers and pastors often have done throughout uh, history, I raise my hands as a sign that God is blessing you through uh, these words and this work. And we encourage you to respond in a similar way. Uh, you don't have to. No one's expected to. But if you would like to, you may also open or raise your hands as a sign that you're receiving uh, this blessing and that we participate in blessing one another during this time. So receive this blessing from the Lord. May you follow the words of Jesus Christ, our Savior, to be wise as serpents and yet innocent as doves, living in this world with knowledge and wisdom that comes from God the Father. May you uh, be overcome by the goodness of Jesus Christ who died for us filled and empowered with the Spirit to go forth and share the love of Christ in all places at all times with your words and your deeds. Go in peace with the blessing of the Lord. Amen.